All right, so my name is Michelle. I'm one of the pastors here. And today is the last sermon in the series that we've been doing called A People Moving Forward, which is found in the book of Joshua. And so I thought that maybe I would give you a bit of a quiz, see how, how well you've grabbed everything, or maybe you've missed a few sermons along the way, and this is going to help you get caught up in the story of the Israelites when they entered Canaan. So I actually am going to give you a quiz. You're going to see it up on the PowerPoint here, and we're going to vote with our hands, okay? So first question. When the Israelites reached the edge of the Promised Land, one of the first obstacles that they had to cross was A, the Jordan River, or B, the Nile River. So if you think it's the Jordan River, raise your hand. All right, and if you think it's the Nile River, raise your hand. Okay, now a lot of you aren't raising hands. I didn't see any votes for the Nile, but everybody's got a vote. So yes, that's right. They came to the Jordan River to go into the western part of Canaan. They had to cross the Jordan River. Next question. When they did cross the Jordan River, what did they do to commemorate this? A, they each got a tattoo. (laughs) Or B, they built a memorial out of stone. So if you're voting for tattoos, raise your hand. Oh, great, we got one vote, great. (laughs) And if you're voting for they built a memorial out of stones, raise your hands. Oh, smart, smart group. That's right, God led them through the Jordan River. He parted the, the river just like he did the Red Sea. And this was an amazing miracle of God. So they built a memorial so that every time they came back to that point, the people would remember it. All right, next question. Uh, Number three, the names of the two spies that met with Rahab were Joshua and Caleb. If this is true, put your hands up. All right, and if it's not true, put your hands up. Ah, see, this one's, you're you're hesitating because it's a trick question. The no's are right. Joshua and Caleb were the spies 40 years prior, right? When they came to the edge of Canaan the first time. We're told in Joshua 2, we don't know the names of the spies that met with Rahab. They were just two young men. Next question. When they crossed over to the west side of Canaan, the first city that they conquered was A, Jericho, or B, I. Hands up for Jericho. All right. And hands up for the city of I. Oh, you guys aren't voting. I'm I'm assuming all the people that aren't putting their hands up, it's because this is just too easy for you. Of course, it was Jericho, right? We remember that story where they walked around the walls seven times, and on the seventh time, the walls came down. God miraculously gave them the city of Jericho. Next question. All of Israel was held responsible for Achan's sin. What did Achan steal that belonged to the Lord? A, gold and silver and the budded staff of Aaron, or B, gold and silver and the um, Babylonian robe? So everybody needs to vote. If it's A, gold, silver, and the budded staff of Aaron, uh, you're all too smart. It is B, gold and silver and a Babylonian robe. All right, last question. The people who deceived the Israelites into a treaty were A, the Jebusites, or B, the Gibeonites. Hands up if you believe it's the Jebusites. All right, and hands up if you think it was the Gibeonites. All right, that was just from last week, wasn't it? So we learned last week the Hivite people who lived in the city of Gibeon had made a treaty with the Israelites. And if you want to hear how they did that, how they tricked them, You can read chapter 8 or you can listen to last week's sermon. God had told the Israelite people, you are to not make treaties with the people of Canaan. But they did so anyways. But God brought a lot of good out of this. And eventually the Gibeonites were actually serving in the temple of Yahweh. And they became integrated with the Israelite community. So in our story today we're going to continue to hear about this relationship between the Israelites and the Gibeonites. A crisis happens. And Joshua goes to the Lord with an incredibly bold prayer. And we're going to talk about 
how he felt comfortable doing that, if it was appropriate, and if it's appropriate for us to do as well. So let's have a look. We're going to turn to Joshua chapter 10. And uh, that is page 215 in your pew Bibles. All right, Joshua chapter 10, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> now Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than I, and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoam, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Eglon, or uh, help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to stand against you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Beth Horon, and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makedah. As they fled before Israel on the road, down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. So these five kings, they plan on attacking Gibeon because this Israeli-Gibeon treaty was a real threat to the surrounding cities. You see, Joshua and the Israelites, they've come in, they've conquered Jericho and Ai, and the Hivites, they don't just have the city of Gibeon, they have three other cities as well. So they're combined forces now, they have the whole central portion of Canaan, dividing the north from the south. So Joshua's in a real strategic position here, and this is really terrifying a lot of the kings in the area. Now you remember from last week, the Israelites were tricked into making a treaty with the Gibeonites. They had deceived them. And more importantly, Joshua and the elders didn't consult with the Lord. But think about it. This could have solved all their problems. Let those five kings come in and wipe out Gibeon. They deserve it. They lied to us. They were yet to see any good that had come out of this treaty. I mean, this had just happened, right? They're still feeling foolish. They're, they're still feeling angry about the whole thing. But no, they swore an oath. And so they honored the covenant that they made with the Gibeonites. And they, they didn't honor it passive aggressively. It's like, oh yeah, we're coming. We'll, we'll head out in the morning. No, we're told they left immediately. It was a 20 mile hike with a 3,300 incline or 3,300 feet incline from the march from Gilgal to Gibeon. And they left right away. They made this long, dangerous trek in the dark. And so you see, the Gibeonites had appealed to Israel for help. And then Joshua appealed to God for help. And God also honored the treaty that Israel had made with Gibeon. In verse 
uh, 8, you can see that it says, God says to them, you've got nothing to fear. They are not going to be able to stand against you. I'm going to give you every single one of them. It was a promise. It was a promise that they were going to completely defeat their enemies. And as we've been working through this book in Joshua, we saw that in chapter 1, God made the same promise to Joshua then. And so God doesn't always need to make new promises. What he does for us is he repeats the old promises to reassure us, right? He doesn't need to make new promises, but he just has to remind us of the promises that are always there in whatever new situation that we're in. God did three things to help the people win this battle. So the first was that it says that he threw them into confusion. He threw the enemy into confusion. It doesn't really explain what that means. The second thing is, is that he sent hailstones. And it says that the armies of the five kings were decimated by these hailstones. So even though God doesn't really need the Israelites to win this battle, that's not how God works. He interacts with his people, right? He's a team player. Even though he does the brunt of the work, he still expects Joshua to do his part, right? Joshua had been promised that not only would he win the battle, that he would win it completely. But he still did what God told him to, and he rallied the people, and they set out and they marched right away and made the long, dangerous trek at night. Now, I said that there was three things that God did, so let's read about the third. So Joshua 10, starting in verse 12. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel in the camp at Gilgal. That's quite a request that Joshua made, right? Pretty bold. God, I need you to stop the sun and the moon because I'm not finished doing the work uh, that you've asked me to do. And to understand Joshua's mindset in this moment when he talks to God like this, we have to understand just some of his past experiences. We can read about one of them in Exodus 17. There's this battle, and it's the first one that happens in the desert under Moses' leadership. The Amalekites are attacking Israel. And Joshua is down there, he's in the battle. But Moses, he goes up on a hill so he can have kind of a bird-eye view of everything. And Moses must have had a conversation with God because we're told that Moses, whenever he had his arms up like this, the Israelites were winning. But then, of course, it's only so long you can hold your arms up like this and they would fall in exhaustion and then the Israelites would start to lose the battle. Now, two other fellows went up on that hill with him. One was Aaron, his brother and uh, high priest, and the other was Hur. So they got Moses to sit down on a rock, and they held his arms up for him. What's interesting about this passage in Exodus 17 is verse 13 says, Joshua won the battle. But in the next verse, it says that the Lord said to Moses, write this all down in a scroll and make sure Joshua hears it. See, Moses was up there on the hill and he knew what was going on, right? This miracle that was happening. Joshua was down in the battle. He didn't know what was going on with the arms, right? So Moses was given instructions, make sure Joshua knows what happened today because I want Joshua to know what God did. And so Joshua learnt from his mentor and he did the same thing. 
And if you look at verse 12, it says that when Joshua was talking to God, he did it in front of the Israelites. He wanted them to hear what he was saying to God because the same thing. When God answers his prayer in a miraculous way, he wants them to know about it. The faith of Joshua was increased by that scroll that Moses had written. And he knew about that. That was part of his past experience. And so now he was saying, I want the other Israelites to see what God is going to do today. So what did God really do? Because there's some different interpretations of what's happened in these few verses. Right? Did God really stop the earth from rotating so that they could have more daylight hours. Now, Joshua asked for the sun and the moon to stop, but we got to remember, this was written 3,400 years ago in a time where people believed that the earth was still and the sun and the moon went around the earth. We know differently now. But did God stop the rotation of the earth so that they would have enough daylight hours to win the battle? It was possible I mean, anything is possible for God. I mean, he created the entire universe. But even the most conservative of commentators are hesitant to claim this because there's just no record of such a cosmic event. And also, there has been some scientific claims where hours have been found or a day, but nothing has been substantiated. Now, the other view is that God honored the intent of Joshua's request and fulfilled it in another way. So like when my husband and I were in Russia a few years ago, we'd be out at one or two in the morning and it was like the white nights. It was as light outside as it is right now. There's some sort of effects of nature that's making this happen. So some people believe that God use the same effects of nature to make this phenomenon happen in this instance. But either way, only God could have made this happen. No human being could ever do this. It is still an incredible miracle of God. Then Joshua says, this was a day like none other. Was it a day like none other because th the sun stops still in the sky? No. Joshua recognizes that if God wants to stop the sun or the earth as we know it, he could do that. But he writes, it was a day like none other because God granted this incredible request of Joshua. Just a, a mere man. Now we're going to come back to that in a moment. Because it is the last Sunday that we're working through the book of Joshua, I wanted to just give you a quick overview of the rest of the book, because I know you're going to read it. There's uh, 14 more chapters in it, and a lot of it isn't in narrative form, so that's why a lot of people don't read it, or it doesn't get a lot of sermon time. But just because something isn't in story form doesn't mean it's not the inspired word of God. And I've put some highlights in there in your sermon notes. So basically, most of it is about the allotment of land. So they've, they're in Canaan, and, and Moses is, or Joshua is saying, you know, tribe of Dan, here's your, your spot. Tribe of Ephraim, here's your spot. But in chapter 14, you can read about how Caleb, one of the original spies, after 40 plus years, is awarded the land that he was promised all those years ago. Chapter 17, I love the story. This is the daughters of Zelephahad. And these women came to Joshua and, or originally they came to Moses, and they said, our father who is, de who is dead, he has no sons. That's not right that we shouldn't inherit any land. And so God went to Moses, or Moses went to God, and God said to Moses, they're right. Give them the land that would have belonged to the sons. Chapter 20, you'll read about cities of refuge. I mean, this was a revenge culture. And so city, cities of refuge were set up so that if you unintentionally killed somebody, you could run and find safety there. Chapter 22 is about the eastern tribes returning to the east side of the Jordan River. 
So you remember we talked about that in the very first chapter. That two and a half tribes said, no, we want to stay over on the east side of the Jordan River. And they were told, no, you need to come over, help the west, get all settled. And when you're done, you can return back. And so they did it. They fulfilled their commitment. And then the final two chapters of Joshua, he's an older man. He, know, he knows he doesn't have much time left. And so he's just giving his final words to the Israelites. And what's amazing about the life of Israel during this time is that the people followed Yahweh, which was the Hebrew name for God, all the days of Joshua and while all the elders lived. So just amazing story. But let's come back to those final few verses. Where did Joshua get the nerve to make such a request to God? Well, we're all a little more bold or brazen with the people that we're the most comfortable with, right? Like if, if I know that Pastor Jordan is heading over to the Como Lake Mall, and I might say to him, hey, can you pick me up a Mars bar? You know, if it's not too inconvenient, if you don't mind, you know, here's a little money, right? But if I'm talking to my husband, it sounds different. <laughs> I could be at home doing absolutely nothing, and it's not outside the, the realm of normal for me to phone him and say, what's for dinner tonight? <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's no food in the house either. I can talk to my husband that way because of our closeness and because I know his character. I know that he loves me. He knows that I hate to cook. And he's Italian. You know, this is how he loves to care for me <laughs> most of the time. There is an intimacy there that allows me to speak to my husband in which I wouldn't speak to another person. And so in the same way, Joshua's boldness with God revealed what Joshua thought of God's character. Yahweh had promised that not only were they going to win the battle, that they were going to completely win it. And so when the situation, the circumstances of the day started to show that this wasn't going to happen, Joshua came to God and he, he called him on it. Because to Joshua, it was incomprehensible that God would not keep one of his promises. Joshua had a closeness with God that assured him that he could trust in his word. So in the urgency of the moment, he called on God to do just that. You know, Moses experienced the same thing. In his story with the Israelites, there's a part where we're told that God is very angry with the Israelites because of their idolatry. And Moses is concerned that God is not going to come with them in their journey. And so Moses boldly goes before God and he says, unless your presence comes with us, we are not going to go. He had this boldness with God because of his intimacy with him. And do you know what Yahweh's response was? God said to Moses, I will do this thing that you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. There was this intimacy with God where Moses could still stand before God and realize that he was this holy, amazing God, but he had this closeness where he could be bold in prayer. And that's why at Calvary, we are always encouraging you to read God's words to us and, and to sit alone with him. Because the goal is not to know about Jesus, it's to know Jesus. I thought I'd share one, one bold prayer moment I've had. About three years ago, my husband's brother had a physical trauma that gave him a, a brain injury. And it wasn't looking good, so they took him up to the operating room and they drilled a hole in his head so that they could relieve the brain swelling. 
but he ended up having a stroke and going into a coma. And I remember coming before God that evening, and I was going to pray in a way that I think is typical of the way I pray, and perhaps many of you pray in these kind of unbelievable circumstances. I was going to pray for his three adult sons, for his mother, for his siblings, for, for my husband. But then the Holy Spirit just kind of impressed something on my heart, which was, he can't die. He doesn't know Jesus. He's not ready to meet his maker. And this is not a way I normally pray, but I came before God and I said, he can't die. He can't because he's not ready to meet you. So my brother-in-law was put on the machines, you know, to keep his lungs and his heart going because the family was from all over Canada. His, his children had to fly in. My husband wanted to go. And, and they wanted to talk to the family about organ donation. The MRI had shown that there was uh, brain stem deterioration. We were told that he was brain dead. Three days later, after his initial injury, my husband arrived in his hospital room and he approached the bed and he said to him, hey, if you know it's your brother from Vancouver, give me a thumbs up. And with his arm still down by his side, my brother-in-law went. And so, of course, the doctor was, was fetched. And the doctor came in and, and he asked him some more questions. He's like, <laughs> he asked him if, um, how many sons he had. And my brother-in-law went, he held up three fingers. How many sisters? How many brothers? Today, my brother-in-law is alive. He had to learn how to walk and talk again. He lost his short-term memory, but he still got his long-term memory. And he lives on his own, and he golfs, and he spends time with family. And praise God. God can do anything. And one of my other brother-in-laws had taken him to church. And he was there and he heard this message about how Jesus loves him and died on the cross and was resurrected three days later. And he turned to my other brother-in-law and he said, this is good stuff. How come you've never told me about this before? You've never brought me here. Which is really funny because he's lost that part of his memory where he never wanted to hear about it. He never wanted to go to church. <laughs> Has he called Jesus his savior yet? Not yet. But I'm not concerned because I've seen what God has done so far. And so now when I am praying for my brother-in-law, the conversation I have with God is, um, you know, you didn't bring him back from the dead so that he could die again. I am still waiting for you to bring him into eternal life. And my past experience with this bold moment is what allows me to be bold with God again because I've seen what he can do. Somebody last week said to me that they knew that God didn't love them anymore. And I was able to say to them, even though that's how you're feeling in this moment, I can guarantee you 100% with confidence that God absolutely loves you. This person is a child of God, a follower of Jesus. And God's promise to us is that nothing can separate us from his love, right? Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons... Um, nor of the present or the future, nor any other powers. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a promise. It's what the Bible tells us. And it's not an intellectual exercise. It's not like, well, the Bible tells me it's true, so it must be true that God loves me. God wants you to know it. He wants you to experience it. So if you are not feeling loved by God, and perhaps it's because some really tough stuff is happening in your life, then I invite you to sit before God 
and be bold before him and say, you've promised to always love me and I don't feel that way and invite him to speak to you about that. Lastly, when we come boldly before God, we have to remember that our confidence isn't in our prayers, right? So we might be like, oh, I prayed for hours last night. Or I'm very persistent in prayer. I've been praying for this person for 30 years. Well, spending time with God and being persistent in prayer are awesome things. But that is not where we get our confidence from, right? We don't get confidence from how we pray. We get our confidence in a God who never breaks his promise to us. Who always loves us. Who has the power to do anything. And in his wisdom, he will decide if he needs to stop the earth from rotating or meet your need in some other way. I just want to finish this time with one verse from Hebrews 4.16. It says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is alive and active and that you speak to us through it. And you speak to us in so many other ways as well. But I pray right now that you will give us the assurance of the promises that you've already told us. You have promised us that your Holy Spirit is with us always. And I pray that as we leave today, that we will be overwhelmed with a sense of that. You have promised us that if we earnestly seek you, that we will find you. And so I pray for anybody in our midst who is frustrated. They have these doubts, and doubts are okay, but there's still not a sense of their spiritual understanding that they can say, yes, Jesus is king. And so I pray for every person in here who is truly seeking to know you. Lord, we call you on your promises and we ask that you will truly reveal themselves, uh, reveal yourself to them this week so they can feel that assurance. We thank you for your promise that you are going to come again and that we are going to live forever with you. And it's in these promises that we can give a, get a higher perspective of life. That no matter what we're going through, you've got everything under control. I thank you for what we have learned as we've studied the life of Israel as they've entered into this land. And we can, we can resonate with their mistakes but we can also rejoice in all the ways that you had helped them have victory and that you can do the same for us. Even when we make bad choices, even when we turn against you, oh Lord, you are gracious and you are merciful and you love us so much. And I just ask very boldly that nobody that's part of our Calvary family, child or adult, will feel that you don't love them and have an incredible plan for their life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.